So today we're very fortunate to have with us Professor Nusra Choudhury. She's an assistant professor at the Anthropology and Sociology Department at Amherst College. Uh, she grew up in Bangladesh, which is now her primary research site. She received a BA from, from, uh, from our own University of Michigan Anthropology Department, so she's a local girl. Um, and she got an MA at, at Texas, also in anthropology, and finally a PhD in 2013 from the University of Chicago. Um, she wrote a dissertation entitled Energy Emergency, uh, Poolbari and Democratic Politics in Bangladesh, for which she received the Sol Tax Dissertation Award from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago. Um, she's also had numerous other awards, including the Charlotte Newcomb Doctoral Dissertation Fellowship in 2009. Her research her, is, focuses on mass protest movements against open pit coal mining in northern Bangladesh, looking at the ethical negotiations as well as political ones. And um, she explores the intersection of political crisis and energy crisis in Bangladesh and elsewhere. She's, she's, she works on themes of government, uh, of rather corruption and development, the state and democratic thought in practice. And what's one of the innovative things about her work is the, this is a real fascinating range of materials that she looks at, the kinds of things that are the real, real stuff of, of protest movements of this kind, but often disappear when people come on the site later on. She, she analyzes work, uh, letters by Muhammad Yunus, whom you all know is the Nobel Prize winning founder of Grameen Bank. She studies, she wrote, writes about electronic, the electronic certification of, of an ID card of a hapless citizen, photographs, cartoons, slogans, and, say, and sayings of protest movements, stories of mining companies and states, and also the symbolism of foreign currency. A theme that r runs through her all these all these uh, uh, all her work is the question of visibility and invisibility of power, and that's found expression in an essay. I invite you to read called in anthropological theory called Picture Thinking: Sovereignty and Citizenship in Bangladesh. The title of her talk today is Revealing Powers, Money, Morality, and Politics in Bangladesh. Bangladesh rather. Um, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, Professor Hal, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, he has described already a little bit um, about my work. Um, basically, this is um, section from my book project, which was based um, on my fieldwork in Bangladesh uh, on a public um, a protest uh, movement against coal mining, which also coincided with a national state of emergency in Bangladesh, which was uh, there from between 2007 and 2008. So um, I ended up doing an ethnography of both the events and kind of looked at them together analytically. Uh, so what I'll do is that I will um, just read my paper and then um, answer more questions about the project as they come. And just uh, as an explanation, this is the building that's kind of hidden um, by the trees is the building of the Asia Energy, the energy company in Fulbari. And as you can kind of tell, it's a very different kind of structure from whatever else is around it. Um, so I just wanted to... Um, put it there, and we can talk more about it. So an artist in Fulbari, in northern Bangladesh, who had drawn more than 50 paintings of a movement against open pit coal mining in the area, made signboards for a living. Under the glass countertop of a decrepit desk in his tiny store, he displayed an old hobby of collecting foreign currency. It had been a couple of years since a group of people, including a foreigner linked to Asia Energy, the controversial energy company, stopped by at his workplace, tucked away in the township's main bazaar. The guest was interested in the curious display of bills. Though quaint, the practice of exhibiting exotic bills as decoration is common in similar settings across South Asia. The gentleman ended up offering five Australian dollars in appreciation of the store owner's little leisure pursuit to be exhibited along with the dirham and the rial. Imagine how much money these people have the artist, still incredulous of the casual exchange of an exorbitant amount, told me a few months after a deadly clash between protesters and the paramilitary ended up in the death of three young men in Fulbari. After all, five Australian dollars was worth more local cash 
than what he could ordinarily expect to earn on a day, and that too without having, in, having put in any labor. The suspicion about the company lingered. What could be the motive behind this? Who in their right mind would squander money in such manner? Despite his otherwise modest background, the artist claimed to have refused to make signboards for the company. In this paper, I argue that money, as a medium of political communication, distilled a set of popular discourses in Bangladesh about governmental corruption and the unequal exchange relations that underline a global culture of natural resource extraction. To do so, I ethnographically situate the popular preoccupation with money that I've documented during fieldwork in 2007 and 2009 in the larger context of Bangladeshi politics. My research project was aimed more broadly at exploring the tense yet mutually illuminating relationship between energy crisis and political crisis. Both were brought into sharp relief by two events. The first was a vibrant resistance movement against open pit coal mining that erupted in Pulbari in 2006. The protests were mobilized against the imminent relocation of more than 100,000 people, the protection of national wealth, and the collusion and corruption of the state and a foreign mining company, then known as Asia Energy and now a subsidiary of global coal management. The second event was a national state of emergency. A military-backed interim regime took over power and dissolved the parliament ostensibly to cleanse a corrupt and criminalized political culture. The two-year-long episode also coincided with my fieldwork. It was in the context of the latter that the recollections of those who became part of the mobilizations against the mines were articulated. The mining project, as originally conceived, is the most challenging development scheme Bangladesh has yet to face. Insofar as its scope and ambition are concerned, placed as it is in a densely inhabited deltaic setting, the project's human and ecological costs are as steep as their wide ranging. When a peaceful siege at the office of the company in August 2006 had met with violence from armed border patrol guards deployed by the state, resulting in multiple deaths and numerous critical injuries, the company had to leave Pulbari in the face of escalating tensions. As the only success story of similar mobilization against multinational capital, in a country unabashedly loyal to neoliberal policies since independence in 1971, Pulbari is now a metaphor for progressive politics and anti-investment conspiracy alike. With the arrival of Asia Energy and the invocation of the emergency, money, I argue, became both a sign and symptom of the corruption of the mining company and the national government. The texts that I offer here for analysis, including interviews, artistic production, and media representations, all center on the mediation of money in its most material form, that is, as bank bills. I read these representations of the money form as an effort to engage with a larger crisis of value that was specific to the historical context of my research. Seeing money in its most mundane, palpable form gave credence to circulating suspicions of laundering, backhanded deals, and collaboration that linked Pulbari to national and global processes. As the 6% royalty rate set for the host country brought home the deeply unequal exchange relationship between Bangladesh and its multinational partner, the company's activities on the ground, such as the distribution of blankets, seeds, motorcycles, televisions, and of course cash as bribe, generated speculations and suspicions of the motives. I read the emphasis on cash and the meanings and affects that it evoked as attempts to identify and defeat the seemingly illicit sources of political power that were structurally beyond the reach of people who faced their immediate and violent effects. The creation of value is a politically mediated process, Arjuna Padurai tells us. What creates the link between value and exchange is politics. New political potential inheres in the creative exchanges in which commodities stray from their specified paths, such as the ones that I will describe today from Fulbari. David Graeber reminds us that the power of money is an effect of a gigantic system of coordination of human activity, and in situations of radical change, a revolutionary moment in which a larger system itself is being transformed, this ceases to be so. In moments like these, the objects themselves become pivots, as it were, between imagination and reality. 
In light of this, I will describe four encounters from my field to theorize what I perceived as the revealing powers of money. I draw out its political, economic, aesthetic, and moral aspects by analyzing various moments of exchange that I had documented in Pulbari. In this, I have been particularly inspired by Michael Tosik's discussion of defacement, Marx's rumination on labor and value, and Georges Bataille's thoughts on expenditure, among others. But first, some more background. The political efforts to bring back democracy during the emergency, as we now know, thanks to various WikiLeaks exposes since, were left to the discretion of foreign diplomats and the technocratic governmental apparatus of the military. The latter's own allegiances and ambitions were as shrouded in mystery as those of the politicians who eagerly sided with the new regime in the name of reform, often to avoid political persecution. In this scenario, cash as a material object turned itself into a sign of multiple processes of commodification, of labor, social relations, and even the nation. If anything, it was money that influenced the policies of the military-backed emergency government. Offered as bribe or stored as coal for the future, money was also the operative theme that animated, at one level, the discourses of development by investment and resource exploitation, and at another level, of resistance against foreign capital and neoliberalism. While Pulbari's subsurface wealth of high-quality coal seemed to hold the key to tackling a much-talked-about and acutely felt national energy crisis, the money circulating around its possible extraction, use, and export in the guise of venture capital or as bribe to politicians and journalists produced news and gossip. The more the emergency and its anti-corruption drive revealed the ill doings of powerful people, the more ordinary people were suspicious of what still lay behind the scene. While the public read stories of incredible flows of money as graft, investment, or deposit, low to mid-ranking government employees were caught with money stashed away not always in foreign banks, but in their pillowcases and under their beds. Osman Goni was one such character. The king of the jungle, Osman Goni, his bed and bedding, a mine of money, was the title of a comic strip about the infamous chief conservator of forests. He was arrested on charges of the destruction of forests under his authority. Goni was alleged to have amassed an obscene amount of wealth by felling and selling government-owned trees and by threatening his subordinates with blackmail by recording and thus potentially revealing their anti-government sentiments on tape. His ill-gotten wealth, including seven apartments in the capital and pieces of land in his ancestral village, amounted to millions. More than Taka 30 million was retrieved from inside the mattress and pillowcases in his bedroom and from a drum of rice in his kitchen. What made this case symbolic, not to mention befitting of parodic humor, was not, or not simply, the incredible sums of money in question. It was the sheer visibility of Goni's wealth in the image of bank bills that became a visual shorthand of the moral degeneration of a bureaucracy of which Goni was a veritable product. More importantly, however, the obsession with money in its most mundane representation was evidence of a certain kind of power against which a whole nation seemed to appear hopeless, helpless. The everyday had suddenly become spectacular and provided the proof that things had gone horribly wrong. Equally crucially, perhaps, the banality of the revelation, in this case, cash hoarded as intimate objects in domestic space, signaled what was still hidden from public view. The apparent visibility bespoke a deeper crisis of representation. As the artist from Pulbari, whom I already mentioned, wondered how much money might these people actually have. So now back in Pulbari. On a quiet afternoon in early 2008, I was sitting at a tea stall in the main bazaar of a neighboring village of Pulbari. Unlike most other local markets in the area, it started its activities after dark, when generator-powered black and white TV sets in tea stalls became makeshift theaters featuring racy local and Bollywood numbers. Their sheer sensory extravagance was matched only by the Islamic sermons blasting from the loudspeakers that were tied to the trees. On most of my day trips to the bazaar and the villages beyond that fell in the adjacent sub-district of Birampur, Pulbari's next-door neighbor, I found a barren, sleepy market instead. 
A single tea shop ran its business by selling meals and snacks, and much to the researchers' delight, bitter leaf and sweets to the men who came in and out of the village for work. As I was paying for one of our regular after-hour snack of chickpeas and sweets at the, st at the tea stall, the young boy who regularly waited on us looked at the two ten taka bills and explained, each time this appa has given me money, the bills were all so clean and shiny, just like paka paved roads. I was, of course, embarrassed to be the source of such an alien commodity. Having a hard time finding change for 50 taka, which is about 70 cents, bill from the rickshaw pullers in Pulbari, I was keenly aware of how striking the crisp bills carried all the way from the capital city must have appeared to him. It was easy to imagine his dealings with the regular clients who had mostly tattered notes to exchange. They were carefully taken out from the folds of their lungi or from the shirt pockets where they nestled with loose change and a roll or two of bidi or filterless cigarettes. The bills were generally old and frail from the intense circulation to which they have been subjected. The long worn creases on them often gave way, the pieces of which were then mended with the help of cello tape. The creases signified overuse. They were at the same time indices of a lack of circulation of big capital. So Pulbari sits on the northwestern tip of Bangladesh, roughly 150 miles from the capital city and a few miles from the border of neighboring India. This was actually a map used by the, produced by the company itself. I've taken it from their literature. Uh, so the map is obviously of Bangladesh and it shows Pulbari, but the images around it, but what would happen if should there be mining are all from um, Australia. Um, just to show, you know, the, the narrative of development. An impoverished region, even by Bangladeshi standards, people in the north are said to lack entrepreneurship compared to those from near or south of the capital. Despite the crops that grow in relative abundance three times a year, businesses in Fulbari were mostly small scale. Only a handful of local entrepreneurial types were said to have made big money by supplying goods and services through legal and extra-legal channels to the nearby granite and coal mining projects and through the black market sale of scrap metal and other factory byproducts. The rest of the well-to-do are either some sort of beneficiary of the mainstream political parties or own lucrative businesses such as brick fields or rice mills. More often than not, the two categories overlapped. The richest man in Pulbari, I was told, was poor a mere 15 years ago. Owner of a humble bitter leaf stall in the market, he lived in a cramped two-room house with his extended family. His impressive rise and cutthroat business acumen were envied, but nobody I came across ever questioned the source of his income or the amount of labor he had put into his monopoly business as a supplier of consumer items to the local market. The metaphor of the paved road stayed with me. On our way back from the bazaar, sitting on a rickshaw on the dirt road that wound its way through paddy fields and thatched huts, I couldn't stop thinking about it. The company had plans for paving the roads around here. Asia Energy's SUVs had zoomed past the same tea stall where people now sat idly yet cautiously, not knowing fully well what the future held. Is the company coming back? They usually asked me after our brief introductions reading my props of notebook and pen and the habit of writing everything down as those of a journalist. I tried to imagine the scenes of drilling expeditions in the nearby fields that had started since 2005. Villagers have contributed to these projects at times with their labor and at other times simply with curious attention as they stood by and watched in large crowds around the drilling sites. And then there were times when they protested violently, beat up people or stole parts of the drilling machinery. What did a paved road mean in this context? How does one make sense of the desire and distrust that were so provocatively captured in the image of clean and shiny money? Desiring and disavowing the allure of the money form are efforts at value creation when established norms of hierarchy and morality are brought under renewed scrutiny. The artwork of Saiful Islam, the artist with whose words I started today's discussion, provides important insights into a local effort at dealing with unprecedented and uncontrollable shifts. Of more than 50 paintings that Islam had made following the violence of 2006, 
The majority focused directly on the bloodshed of August 26th, the corruption of the company, and the resistance movement more broadly. Through the analysis of one of his paintings featured here, drawn in the genre of signboard art, which Islam made and sold for living, I want us to think about the hierarchical valuations of labor, money, and power that inform the words and actions of those who made up uh, what, now, what is now known as the Fulbari movement. So originally about two by three feet in size, the painting is most visibly a juxtaposition of opposites. On the right side of the frame is a farmer whose back faces us. He's muscular in stature and is wearing a lungi and a gamta, which is a cotton towel, tied around his waist. A mathal or a peasant's hat completes the archetypal attire of a rural peasant. With his arms wrapped around a village hut, he seems to be holding on to it. The farmer, along with the house that he is protecting, is seated on a lush green paddy field. A couple of palm and other trees, all standard features in conventional depictions of rural Bengal, make up the backdrop. On the left side of the frame is a gentleman who sits on a chair cross-legged and in Western-style trousers, a shirt, and a tie. The sartorial conventions of an elite educated type stand in stark opposition to the naked torso of the peasant. The officer is employed by Asia Energy, the artist told me when I first saw these paintings at his house in Fulbari. Instead of the open space of the paddy field that the peasant is viciously guarding, there's a desk and a chair. The officer is sitting on the chair with a cigarette lit in his left hand and a bundle of cash in his right. He's puffing out smoke while staring out at the open space where the farmer is guarding his property. More cash, clean and shiny as the boy from the tea shop would say, is neatly organized on the desk, the wall behind which displays a calendar also sponsored by Asia Energy. Copied from an actual calendar that was distributed as bribe by the company, this image shows the hand of a faceless laboratory staff whose apron-clad arm holds one of the many test tubes shown on the page. The test tubes here are representations of those that the company had kept in its laboratory to store samples of soil collected through drilling around the coal mining zone. I saw many of them broken or crushed on the floor when visiting the vandalized, though still guarded, lab a year later. An electric lamp sits on a low table in front of the officer. This is Aslam of Asia Energy. The artist pointed to the officer as he was propping up the painting, leaning it on the wall of his neatly arranged and brightly colored drawing room. This man was the boss of Asia Energy, he stressed using the English word. And he continued, the officer is sitting with money on the table. He's calling the peasant. He's saying, bhai, come and take this, give away the house. But the peasant is saying, no, there is no need for money. He's holding on to the house. They cannot force him. The persistent theme of the refusal of commercial exchange with the company runs through Islam's paintings, which we would do well to recall he enacted in his anecdote about the Australian bill. Equally pertinent here is the status of productive labor that underscores this image and many others that Islam had drawn as moral narratives of a certain genre. The muscular body of the peasant exuding superhuman force and power in holding onto his house with his elongated arms wrapped around it indexes the tenacity and struggle of the local peasant. Also noteworthy are the exaggerated contours of his muscles that are iconic of a physique that can only be a product of physical labor and struggle that make up a peasant's daily existence. In contrast, the relatively thinner, fully clothed body of the company employee features the bourgeois dress code of the educated South Asian salaried class, a familiar, if not mildly, comic product of an erstwhile colonial bureaucracy. At first glance, the painting is divided along a line of demarcation, a fault line of sort. The binaries of urban versus rural, foreign versus indigenous, and wealth versus poverty are familiar tropes in the way the Fulbari movement was narrativized by the activists, the media, and many local residents with whom I interacted. This schema bore the trace of what Alfred Zon Rathel calls the historical division of head and hand as part of class rule when theorizing the status of intellectual and manual labor in Marxist thought. I find many of these dualities folded into the duality of the commodity form itself, which is useful when analyzing the semiotics of Islam's text. Money's uniqueness as a commodity is in its universal equivalence. The peasant is being offered money to sell his land and livelihood 
by a price that is mediated by money. But precisely what kind of a commodity is the money on display on the officer's desk? To answer this question, one would need to probe further. What is the system of reasoning used to explain the exchange economy in a group geared towards the production of use value? And also, what is the character attributed to monetary exchange and the productive process such as agriculture that is vulnerable to the threat of mining? The peasants with whom I spoke, whose agricultural land fell within the mining zone in some fashion, denied money's ability to multiply itself. The land is going to give us returns till the Qiyamat, the apocalypse. Money gets used up just like that. One farmer said to me when asked about the company's promise of monetary compensation, a sentiment that was shared by numerous others. The multiplication of money as capital was not seen as a power inherent in money itself. When abstracted from any particular socio-historical formation, labor power for Marx is pure human possibility. What we see in the body of the peasant in the painting may very well be described as a challenge abstraction that is sheer human possibility. The money being offered to buy the land on which he applies his labor, thus potentially rendering his body exchangeable in hourly wage as a miner, is corrupt. The peasant here is, of course, right to surmise that in the event of mining, not only will he lose his land, that is his primary if not sole source of livelihood, but he will also be turned into a wage laborer and not a capitalist. Still, the peasant aggressively guarding his wealth sees through the ruse of the wage form. That values created by labor alone is something that he stands by. Hence the artist's disbelief in the gift of five dollars, as well as his particular depiction of the evil officer, whose body and demeanor speak of his distance from an economy where the path from labor to value has not been contaminated. Money is a sign of that contamination. Speaking of the long intimacy between dirt and money, Gustav Peebles notes that the most famously unclean money is the money that seems to be magically making more of itself without any apparent labor on the part of its owner. The $5 bill was iconic of foreign money that always stood in a hierarchical relationship with local money in both form and amount. It was simultaneously indexical of extraordinary amount of cash of which this was but a metonymic representation. The exclamation therefore, imagine how much money these people have. Money's corrupting powers were not seen from the perspective of exchange value because the reproductive aspect of capital, the fetishistic quality of money to beget money, was being denied by peasants who questioned its dubious origins and in the process rendered it sterile, incapable of self-generation. If Islam's painting may be seen as one kind of a moral narrative, then the episode of violence that I will recount now forces us to rethink anew the questions of morality, money, and revelation. To explain what I mean, let me describe an episode of violence against the company mediated yet again in reference to cash. I offer here an admittedly complex narrative of resistance in the act of burning money that was described to me by a rural woman. This gesture of destroying an object of intense value brings to mind certain acts of spending that cannot be confused with mechanisms of utility, mass production, or even mass destruction. To illustrate this, I present a relatively better known figure of the movement, whom I shall call Majida. So Majida was already quite a celebrity when I met her nearly a year and a half after she, along with a few other women from her neighborhood, had come out of their homes to protest the brutality of the border patrol guards. Interviewed multiple times by the print and television journalists who thronged Pulbari in the frenzy that followed the August 2006 killings, she was by far the best known representative of the women of Pulbari. I emphasize the word women because the wide participation of women was one aspect of the movement that was consciously highlighted and at times partially choreographed by the activists and the media. This does in no way suggest that women didn't participate. They did, often directly, and often in ways that at times exposed the very limits to the idea of political participation. Yet, their retrospective co-optation into the movement remained a complex and revealing aspect of the local political culture. So this calendar, <clears throat> which was published by a local uh, resistance group, gives you a sense of 
the way um, women were used, um, women's images of women were used as a very significant aspect of the movement. So by the time I interviewed Majida, she was a celebrated token of that highly potent gendered symbol of the Fulbari movement. An op-ed article first published after August 26, 2006, and reprinted again on Fulbari Day the next year, had to say the following in a section titled, Simply the Women. It's rather ironic that a woman who has been utterly neglected by society, who is detested by and large for not being honorable, was the first woman to strengthen our social cohesion. It was she who prompted other women to come out on the streets too. In plain English, she's a prostitute and often remains outside a Fulbari on business. The article is quoting an activist who is here describing how Majida was one of the first to come out with a machete the day after the killings in 2006, a move that had played a formative role in the process that eventually led to the signing of the peace treaty between the government and the people of Fulbari. Majida's profession, though not so subtly handled in this piece, was a public secret. My research assistant, who became a good friend and confidant over time, still went to great length to give me a sense of what Majida did for a living before giving a name to her profession. As could be predicted, the rest of Hulbari knew about her, and she was already mentioned in at least one or two published articles. Originally in English, the newspaper that ran this story could hardly claim any local readership and consequently any impact on her everyday life. Majida's was a tiny tin roof cement house, a mere 10 minute walk from the center of the township, barely a stone's throw from where the shooting had taken place. There were two small rooms and a tiny kitchen area where she lived with two daughters, the eldest one about 10, 11 years old. Her husband lived with her, though he seemed to travel quite a bit for work. Her eldest daughter from a previous marriage was married and lived elsewhere. She was playing with the newborn lying on the blanket on the floor when we entered her house. That one was born right after the movement, she said affectionately pointing to the baby, reminding us that she was pregnant when she charged back at the paramilitary, who was indiscriminately beating up neighborhood boys and some of the local leaders. Madida's excitement in talking to us was not unusual for women I met in the villages who were more willing to welcome strangers into the intimacy of their homes, though her energy, honesty, and what I can only describe as charisma were scarcely found in others. Sorry, not this one. What would, sorry. <laughs> it's kind of gone. I put Hussein's house to fire, she said suddenly at one point in our conversation, interrupting her husband's reminiscences of the events from a year ago. Um, he was particularly animated when explaining how to tell if someone was a collaborator. And the figure of the collaborator plays a very significant role because everybody is suspect of collaborating with the company. Locally known as a dalal, a collaborator was a ubiquitous figure in Fulbari, rife as it was with suspicions of profiting from the foreign company and the myriad forms of its corruption. Hussein was allegedly a collaborator. Why should I flee from my house if there's no fear in me? Majida's husband asked rhetorically. Hussein was the one who fled first, you understand? He left on his motorcycle. Why would I run away if there's no weakness in me? It was at this point that Majida intervened. I put Hussein's house to fire, she said. Her husband tried in vain to change the course of the discussion, understandably cautious of divulging the details of how his wife had been a part of a large crowd that had attacked and looted the houses of Dalals. Majida continued. Then Hussein's, sorry, let me find the. Then Hussein's house was put to fire. The sack of money burned down. At last, when there was a light wind, one could only see the seals on the notes. Addressing the older woman standing at the doorstep as grandmother, she nearly shouted, He kept money in the turmeric, Nani. Nani is um, maternal grandmother. The audio recording of the interview at this point is hard to decipher, with Majida's voice drowning in the parallel conversations taking place between her husband, the older woman, whom she addresses as Nani, and my friend. It's still not clear to me whether she said, meaning he kept money in the turmeric, 
और होल्दी मोतो टाका थू से ही केप्ट मनी एज ही वुड कीप टर्मरिक नो मैटर इट्स अ प्रोडक्टिव कन्फ्यूजन इन बोथ केसेस शी वॉज डिस्क्राइबिंग अ सैक दैट वॉज शॉकिंगली दैट वॉज अ शॉकिंगली इम प्रोबल प्लेस फॉर स्टोरिंग मनी वेर एज कीपिंग मनी लाइक टर्मरिक वुड मीन फिलिंग अप अ सैक विथ इट कीपिंग इट विथ टर्मरिक वुड सजेस्ट दैट द मनी वॉज हिडन इन अ सैक अलॉन्ग विथ टर्मरिक Her voice, shrill and almost jovial, betrayed both the shock and humor at this scene of plunder. The reason behind Majida's clear excitement in seeing the fire, as I see it, is not simply that money can be stored like condiment. Money, when put to fire, also burns in flames like any other object. How did you know that there was money there? I asked her. To this, she almost repeated herself, because all the sacks burned down, only the seals were there. If you blew lightly on it, the sack would be all ash. She continued to describe how the ashes were flying around in the breeze, providing adequate proof that the bills did burn. What was offered as the ultimate evidence was the seal, for which she used the English word once, the symbol of paper money's source of authority. Bills are ultimately issued by banks, and the seal is their recognizable feature. Bills, therefore, are also a form of advertisement for the nation. For Majida, it was visible even when the rest of the bill was consumed by fire. Emulation of votive money and similar ritual objects is not novel to ethnographers. Hyoni Kwon, for example, observed money burning within the Vietnamese ritual setting and has found a wide circulation of votive currency in the form of US dollars. He has rightly situated this trend in the backdrop of the trauma of Vietnam's war with the United States as well as the practice of propitiatory and other rituals across Southeast Asia. Similarly, Julie Chu has found American currency as the favored form for certain kinds of cosmic exchanges in a rural Chinese village where migration to the US and the resulting remittances play a significant role in people's religious and social lives. The symbolic aspect of money circulation is further corroborated by ethnographers who have found paper bills facilitating social exchanges of myriad sorts. The paper bills used to decorate, for example, a bride's hair in Papuan weddings reveal what had to be in plain view, that is, its fetish character, though in this case more as what Apadurai in a different context calls a literal fetish. In the absence of similar rituals and cultural tropes around money, Majida's use or abuse of paper money poses significant questions. What kind of politics was being communicated in these displays of plunder? And more relevant for our purposes, why and how did resistance get articulated in forms that were unique while underlining what seems to be the central issue in money and culture, the monetization of morality? I find the concept of defacement a drama of revelation, as Michael Tosik describes it, as a useful analytic to make sense of the words of Majida, as well as those of the artist and the young boy, who we would do well to recall, reacted positively, though pointedly, to the ten taka bill that I had offered him at the tea stall. In the most banal sense, what were revealed in Majida's act were the corrupt actions of Hussein, who had kept sacks full of money in his pantry. Money was simultaneously out of place and all over the place, as Vicente Rafael would say. Her joining the pillaging crowds in this burn-off stemmed from anger and grievances that she and others nurtured because of the violence unleashed by the state on their neighbors, kin, and their own bodies. There is still something more profound and fundamental about spending that cannot be identified with a calculation, a planning, a goal orientation that is inherent to a commonsensical conception of resistance. Unlike in mass destruction, the kind of expenditure that I believe I had a glimpse of when listening to Majida, there's always something left over, some excessive element, some energy. It is this that is burned off and that sets us afire, Georges Bataille would say. Tosik tells us that when the human body, a nation's flag, money, or a public statue is defaced, a strange surplus of negative energy is likely to be aroused from within the defaced thing itself. What he calls negative energy is similar to Bataille's concept of heterogeneous energy. In the energy regime of Bataille, ritual or sacrifice entails a production and consumption of energy that is not stockpiled or quantified in the same way as are raw materials or energy resources used in industrial society. 
It's different from the homogeneous energy that is merely the power to do work and generate apparent order. The energy stored in and released from a strip-mined mound of coal, for example, is qualitatively different from the bodily energy discharged at the contact of an eroticized object. Money, no doubt, falls into the category, as do other symbols of state power. The ethnographic moments that I described here are all instances of revelation. The foreigner who offered $5, out of amusement, no doubt, inadvertently revealed a certain dangerous and powerful aspect about him and his foreignness, that is, he and those whom he represented must have a lot of money. The drama that Majida described unfolded around unmasking Hussein, proving that after all, he was a collaborator. Why would anyone try to hide money, and that too in sacks with or as condiment? The act of burning or defacing money was at some level an act of revelation. Revealing the secret, however, only compounded the suspicions about the power of collaboration and the dangerous power of money that it relied on. Money was burned because it was valuable, and it was more so even when its charred remainder was scattered in the wind, offering further evidence of its expenditure. It has long been established that not all money is equal or interchangeable. The elaborate rules by which people use and earmark monies evidence how money is infused with doubts, fears, and desires that are specific to the cultural contexts in which it circulates. Scholars have already questioned the commonplace assumption about money as a transcendental object unbound by cultural norms. Collector's money is carefully kept out of circulation, my artist friend reminded me. Its value lies precisely in the non-exchangeability of the bills or coins, secure, stationary, and on display like objects of art. The episode from the Fulbari Bazaar was, however, telling of a different kind of relationship to money that I believe has been symptomatic of the movement against coal mining in Fulbari and to a certain extent that of Bangladeshi political culture immediately following the declaration of the state of emergency. Its significance exceeds the mere observation that people value different monies differently. At one level, this was a transaction in which two parties of extremely asymmetrical power relations met in a chance encounter. Their interaction was an exchange whose value, as and when recounted to an outside observer, was established in the refusal of a future exchange, that is, commercial relationship with the mining company. At another level, the artists coming face to face with the $5 bill, offered casually and unconditionally, garnered suspicion that was stoked by a gift whose origin was partially known. The bill stimulated speculations as to the very motivation of giving. For our artist, the bill then was a potent symbol of the powers of reckless capital for which the company was already notorious. At the same time, it was a token of the type of hidden and corrupt exchanges for which important people, including the former heads of state, were at the time of our conversation, were being sent to prison. Like our artist, a brief unveiling of this power makes one wonder about the extent of that which was still kept secret. One could argue that Majida, a prostitute whose profession, though widely known but rarely commented upon, was herself a public secret. The act of defacement and destruction, which she performed again in her telling of the narrative of violence to me, was also a gesture whereby she achieved a certain publicity in the community that was quite different from before, one which transformed and transcended, albeit partially, her previously established role as a public woman. In the midst of an intense crisis of value, when allegations of collaboration saturated the public domain and generated violence of symbolic and literal types, through the collective burning and looting, she created value as an individual as well as a member of a wider community. Matida's actions and words, not to mention her jest and laughter, insist on a more nuanced analysis of what counts as politics. Matida's stories or the artwork of Islam, along with the words of some others that I've mentioned here in passing, are surely moral narratives that help ascribe value to the subject in action. Simultaneously, they bring into scrutiny, as ethnographic instances from other cultures show, money's role in commodification. People in Fulbari, we have seen, quantified all the time. And yet, this quantification did not necessarily involve standardization or universal commodification. While Islam's painting is an elegy to productive labor, incommensurable to wage labor, 
Majida's act of protest is also a form of resistance against the preeminence of economic concerns in both the discourses for and against mining in Fulbari. So I want to conclude by echoing what Karen Strassler has to say about Indonesia after Suharto's fall. I quote her, it was a time when dystopian critiques of corruption flourished alongside utopian visions of political authenticity. Strassler's pronouncement bears undeniable resemblance to the historical moment that forms the backdrop of my discussion today. In that scene of crisis, ordinary people appropriated money status as a powerful medium of communication to articulate their visions of political authority, just ex exchange relations, and morality. Moreover, by whenever we see the pronounced claim of money being dirty, as Peebles reminds us, we should also see it as a moment in an ongoing process of social boundary construction by interested parties, rather than as a legitimate critique of money per se. Venting his anger against a disloyal nation, a part-time farmer from the same village as the boy from the tea shop said to me, they want money, we will stop supplying the paddy. Now whether they want to eat money dry or they want to eat it by soaking it in water, it's up to them.